You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and welcome to 2022's World Tour with Vasim Khans. The Dying Day, chapters dying day. 1 to 15. Herds, it's good mm. to have you back. Flex, it's good, to, it's good to hear your lovely voice. I haven't been in contact with you for a little while due to yeah. real life excitement and circumstances but i know i it's know it's good to be back on the show with you for another year i think it's going to be the best one yet no i'm i'm really glad we're starting with this book <laughs> continuing our venture into uh indian historical fiction it certainly helps that it's a good book <laughs> we wrapped up with the absolutely incredible uh <laughs> murder in old bombay by nev march yes and then we are doing vasim khan's the dying day this time i also read the prequel book uh midnight at malabar house mm. Uh, in preparation for this, but we won't be talking too much about it. We won't spoil anything that The Dying Day doesn't already spoil itself. I was going to say, there are definitely some spoilers. Yes. Shout to Fernandez. No, no, I'm very excited to continue our our journey through Indian crime fiction because I definitely wasn't expecting to be here uh, on doing like research into particularly the the police in India. It makes a lot of sense. There's a lot yeah. of good crime fiction over there. Yep, yep. But um, it, this journey kind of started for me when I when I covered The, wait, the Waiter last year yes. as part of a, an interview and then Murder in Old Bombay and now this. And it's it's been great. Uh, it's been a really good time. Yeah, so let's kind of get into the gritty of things here. The Dying Day is the second venture of Persis Wadia. Uh, it takes place just days after the prequel Midnight at Malabar House. Yes. A real copy of Dante's Inferno that was abandoned in India by an academic uh, during one of many uprisings before the British pulled out of India. Uh, and that's a, that's a real thing that still exists there. We mentioned that with Vasim Khan at the end of last year's show. It goes missing. The One of the scholars that yeah. was studying it basically runs off with it, leaves a King James Bible in its place. Of course he does. <laughs> and uh, we're now on the trail of it with many a riddle to, uh, to tide us along the way. <laughs> Goodness. We're on the trail of something. Can I say, I, as a good murder mystery puzzle solver, yes. I did in fact pause the book. In order to solve that riddle, the first riddle that we found, and I was disappointed, a little disappointed that I wasn't able to actually solve it this week because yeah. I managed to do it by the the end of the chapter it's presented in, which I, I actually mm. really enjoyed. I thought it was a very well put together riddle. Yeah. Uh, beg. Beg is a very, beg with two Gs is a great it's clue. So I loved that one. Yeah. I, I also think it's it's really, really endearing how much Vasim Khan like teaches Indian history in his riddles. Yes. I have really enjoyed <laughs> while trying to figure these out all of the Sunny. things I am learning in the process. Oh my goodness. Can I, okay, I'll tell you what, I, what we can talk about. The, um, at the very opening of the book, there is in fact a, uh, a riddle. Yes. Hold on. Let me, let me grab the riddle. I've, before. I've got it up. If you want me to just read it. I don't care. I want to read it. <clears throat> Once the seat of Kings refined from whence an empire was defined, lost in war and invasion bold, dismembered piece by piece for gold and precious stones of countless hue, rara aves among the sir, sir, sir like it lives on now in myths of yore, sought in vain forever, forevermore. Now, hang on a minute. I don't think hang on a minute. Every... No, 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 no. We're not continuing yet. What? That's the riddle for before the story begins for you. Yes. Mine's different. You have a different one? I have a different what do you mean one. You have a different riddle. Oh, no. <laughs> mine is <laughs> mine can't. is a spectral huh. presence at water's edge that grief is twisted by sovereign's pledge. Twixt walls of snow lie lovers past neath stony crown by mason's cast. Wait. Dude. What? Hold, we need to research this between episodes uh, because I figured mine out, I, I believe. There's no answer on the website. Mine, I believe, is the, uh, the peacock throne. Uh, which was taken in a Persian invasion. Oh my god! And basically just taken apart by by the Persians and such. This is so exciting! I was going to leave this for you to solve, and now There's we have a one second each. Riddle. We have one each. Well, I've already put my answer forward, so a peacock throne is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, if you want to solve yours, go I'll right ahead. To, I'll I have guess. to get back to you. I wasn't ready for this. I'm actually. I wasn't ready for this either. This is great. I'm startled. This is very strange. What a fun twist. Well done, Vasim Khan. What a twist! <laughs> anyway, back to the book. <laughs> but anyway, the, I, I guess that's that's kind of the fun thing, though, uh, that we'll get into yeah. is, is you know as the book goes on, is that Vasim Khan is teaching us things about history, about the peacock throne, about whatever the heck riddle you've got, yeah, about you know uh, Sinan, the architect, the Ottoman architect, and and George Wittet who who built that the big gate that I forget the name of. Look. Point is, 
his riddles are all about historical yeah. figures who must have existed before 1950 and that anyone in the bot age can solve relatively easily without having to go to a geography expert yeah. because we have the internet. So he has to build these riddles in such a way that we, we can solve them, but also that it's not too easy. You can't just look up the name of a person and figure it out. Um, and he, he's got a good sense, I think, of how how to direct us towards interesting historical events and figures mm. uh, and also keep a good element of whimsy in there, I yeah, think is yeah, the other thing sure. I want to, to highlight. Well, mm. the, the other interesting thing that I did want to point out about the riddles here is that mm. I, I suppose as the cover of my edition of the book implies, <laughs> uh-huh. it, it, it's definitely got a few nods to the Da Vinci Code in here. I haven't read the Da Vinci oh, really? Code in years. I do plan to finish it before next week's show, but I remember that the solution to that book uh, was, was a bit of a meme. The The main riddle of that book uh-huh. is notoriously simpler than the book pretends it is. Interesting. And I think that Vasim has done an incredible job of uh, making a well-balanced riddle, as you imply, that's very easy yes. to find if you go digging for it, but doesn't like- It doesn't jump out at you. Spill off the page automatically. No, yeah. no. I, I definitely think that's the trick. Um, especially- I mean, this is, I wish we could just talk for hours about this, but like I, I've been on the internet, I've seen some of the, the ARGs that people play around, you know, certain media releases. Uh, uh, there was a very infamous example of a, of a, a playable trailer. Yes. Yes. It's called PT playable trailer that came out and the developers expected the ARG would take at least a week to solve uh-huh. and people solved it overnight when it was <laughs> released. And it, it's just a very simple walk through corridors horror game, yeah. but the solution involved speaking into the microphone and your PlayStation controller and saying, Jareth to your empty room, presumably mm-hmm. when nothing else in the game had indicated that you would have to actually speak into the controller. Uh, like it, it was insane. It was insane. Yeah. But, but the internet at this point, you know, you put a riddle out there, you have to expect that it'll be solved within 24 hour period. Yes. I assume that the competition that is listed at the start of these books did not last long. No, I, I assume so as well. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose let's jump into the story proper. So Persis Wadia, <laughs> I think one of the most interesting things about her as a character for this book is that her father is a bookshop owner. There is a really fantastic quote in the previous book, uh, which I, I won't read directly because uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't. I don't want to take the joy uh-huh. away from you. But the way that sure. her father is characterized really, I think, lends itself to why she is the perfect detective for this book. You know, she has her interests in uh, literature and learning. history and learning oh. and despite being, I guess, what some would consider the stereotypical nerd through that, uh, <laughs> is still an absolute go-getter powerhouse and the first female policewoman in India in this fictionalized uh, version of events. She's great how, like, no-nonsense she is. She does occasionally uh, bite her tongue, so to speak, but yeah. it's very rare, and it's always in, in like, in service of the investigation. Yes. Um, she is absolutely a nerd and I love that nerds unite. And I don't know, I, I really appreciate her presence. And of course, being the first female police inspector gives Vasim Khan an excellent lens to view the police force through and to view, mm. you know, like I remember one of the moments that kind of stuck out to me was how she, she keeps getting asked, so what's it like being the first female police inspector? How cool yeah, is that? She's, she's like, like the next person that asks me, I will punch them. <laughs> yeah, she's like it's like I'm an animal in the zoo. This is awful. Yeah, yeah. This is degrading. Like, oh, it's just so frustrating that people can't just accept it and move on. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that they point out at the start of this book is that the previous one uh, had her basically being subverted by someone else who was working alongside her, who was uh-huh. feeding information to the press, hoping that she would fall on her own sword. And that obviously didn't go according to plan. Someone that she admired, someone she looked up to, such as the folly of humans. And let's say. I, I really like, I think we've only really gotten the beginnings of it as of chapter 15, but they're forced to work together again in this book on the case of a woman who was found Unlikely with her jewelry. yeah legs cut off uh, on a train track in the city. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously in a murder mystery, it's going to end up being relevant somehow, though we're not quite clear on what yet. Uh, but I really like the way that it, it, it it's such a powerful note for those two characters that it feeling like a B-plot doesn't really matter because their working dynamic is so interesting 
you know, you get a very authentic sense of like the ingrained misogyny uh, that her coworker has and Persis just inability to let him take charge in what is his case. Yeah. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. as a reader, you, it's so easy to side with her because so often she is right and her decisions make sense, but other times she's just headstrong. Yeah, there's definitely a big part of the story that is propped up by the the, the character drama mm. between those those two individuals, the uh Sherlock and, and possible Watson. It's it's kind of hard to define yeah. the, the exact relationship. Um, but also, and also between her and her, her family, like, mm. a, like, I think that that is, uh, definitely part of what makes this novel work that we're not just dealing with dry old dusty tombs. Yeah. Like, uh, the, I mean, there's a, the geographer, I believe says, you know, I like to get my hands dirty and look at the marble and, you know, really get in there with an archeological kit. And it's mm. like, if we did that for the whole novel, it'd get stale. So definitely having these, these characters with very strong opinions about, you know, what's acceptable in the workplace, what's acceptable in the home life, uh, what's acceptable in a murder case, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and to your point, uh, we get a lot of internal monologue from Persis and she thinks a lot about how we, we, whenever she's berating, uh, this, this officer for stupid decisions he's making. Yes. She'll often think, I'm not going to say that I also had that thought <laughs> before I quashed it because it was a stupid idea. Yeah. Like she's made the same mistake that he's making. She just didn't say it out loud. Which I think is a very a very interesting piece of characterization for her, for sure. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that's interesting there, you mentioned that uh, mm. Fernandez has kind of become the Watson in this situation. Yeah, and, and we do have a couple of other, you know, like Huck and Burlo, who are basically like the police station's thug characters. I mean, all we know about them. But let me tell you, I've written down just very short summaries of all the characters. Before Ben yet- says this, I should say that they are even less <laughs> present in the previous novel. Great. All we know is that they were at a stadium like quelling riots or something. Yeah. So I've written them down as detectives and toughs mm-hmm. as they're like two like code words that I associate with them, which is great. Alongside Fernandez, the scummy detective and Akbar, the Persian cat. But the, anyway. the interesting <laughs> thing though, is that Archie Blackfinch, Archimedes Blackfinch, if you will. Uh-huh. Archimedes. Who, who yep. very much feels like a side character in this book was kind of like oh, the goodness. main Watson of the last book. And it's been really interesting seeing him switch into this other role where he's now teaching another person how to do his job because that's ostensibly why he's in India. Sure. And I kind of liked that these two characters, Persis and uh, Archimedes, who were a great duo in the previous book are now both having to learn to work with other people and that's mm-hmm. keeping their own Watson duo <laughs> apart. It hasn't like it's paid off yet in this story, but I'm really looking forward to what we get of it as we go further in. I feel like it's more Persis having to learn to work with new people because <laughs> Archie brings his uh, student, I believe. Yes. Muhammad Akram. Uh, but he brings him on to work when they when they come to the tomb of of, of George Watet, which is the whole thing. Yes. Uh, and and Percy's is like, but why can't I work with you? And he's like, well, because I might not always be here. Yeah. Which is some ominous foreshadowing. <laughs> it's anyway. it's very interesting. It's I'm I'm really excited to get into that. <laughs> Anyway, we should wrap this part of the discussion here. We're going to talk a little bit more about the mysteries and the riddle as we come back towards the end of the show. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing chapters 1 to 15 of Vasim Khan's The Dying Day. This is 2SER 107.3. Stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here. And hey, I just wanted to jump in before we continue with today's discussion on The Dying Day with just a short bit of housekeeping for Death of the Reader this year. You may have caught on at the end of last year. We had a few guests on, including but not limited to Jim Noy of The Invisible Event, Sean Britton of uh, 2SER, now X2SER, as the case may be, solving mysteries here with us on the show. And we wanted to do a bit more of that this year. So if you are a mystery reader, mystery writer, mystery blogger, someone who uh, has some interesting things to say about a piece of text or just love a challenge, up at 2ser.com slash death of the reader with a hyphens in between each of those last four words. You can find our contact details to get in touch with us and uh, let us know 
if you want to be involved with the show, we'd love to have you on, solve some murder mysteries, talk about this fun stuff. We don't have a heap of slots available for the year, but jump in while you can, and we'd love to have your expression of interest. Again, that's 2ser.com slash death of the reader with hyphens in between each of the last four words, or you can go to the schedule page with the link in the top right of the 2ser.com homepage and find us that way. We're going to jump back into the dying day with Vasim Khan in just a second. You're on 2SER 107.3. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing Vasim Khan's The Dying Day, a historical Indian novel set in the 1950s, just after the British exit proper from India. And uh, Hertz, we were having a good fun discussion about the characters in the story that we've been introduced to, some of the fun holdovers from the previous novel, Midnight in Malabar House, which is also great fun, but we aren't talking about uh, in depth today. We couldn't. But Hertz. It's okay. I haven't read it. We we had a bit of a Mm. moment earlier on the show today where we realized that our books have different riddles at the start of them before the story begins. (laughs) And w- which is great fun, and we'll talk about that hopefully with Vasim Khan in the coming weeks. Uh, maybe I'd maybe we just did. I there. don't know. We're recording this a- ahead of time because I'm- we'll find out <laughs> in the future past. But yeah, that's such that's how it is. Yeah. But I think the the fun thing about these riddles, as we mentioned, is that they're really well balanced and do a good job of teaching history as well as being engaging. Mm. And I think the fun thing that carries across from that into the regular mystery side uh, of the story is that Vasim Khan is doing an incredible job of setting a mystery scene while making it feel like a regular scene, if that makes sense. Okay. Like, we walk into John Healy, our victim and the guy who stole Dante's Inferno's apartment, and it's very clear, at least to me from the way he describes it initially, that it's in disarray, but our characters Mm. don't quite notice it the first time they're there. Sure. So, So we have a really good sense that someone else is also on Healy's trail. You know, it's kind of to be expected in this kind of novel, but I really enjoyed that and uh, a few other scenes where we visit certain locations and uh, Vasim Khan very explicitly omits details to the characters, but not to us. And I really enjoyed how, uh, maybe subtle isn't the word, but gentle uh, those (laughs) inclusions were. Yeah. I I suppose so. I definitely do like the fact that the, the characters don't, like obviously, it's it's clear by this, but we've had the autopsy of the of the last found on the train tracks, which is a yes, an absolute classic place to find a corpse in these books. And I guess that's that's part of your point, I, I suppose. We we know that she was murdered, but it's not one hundred percent treated as a murder case. It's treated as a, as a suicide yeah. initially. Like that's that's kind of what they're expecting. Um, even the cops who are in charge, I don't, we don't get their names, but the cops who are like in charge of the scene. They're not really treating it with any particular respect. Yeah, it basically gets sent to the Malabar House police station where these characters work because it's considered so unimportant and they're like the dirt of the Indian police force. Well, I, I think it was it was also because it is a, a white woman who is found yes. dead, and that is a political thing, with the British having recently, you know, you know, packed up from from Bombay and all that, or Mumbai, as as might also been also be known. And nobody wants to hold that particular grenade. Yes. Um, <laughs> so they put it in the book. I think nobody nobody holding particular grenades, that line definitely is like th- the carryover theme of so many things that happen in this series. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. I think that Malabar House is not just set up as, you know, this is what we said, all the misfits we don't know what to do with. Mm. It's also what we said the people who, if they got fired because they handle a case poorly, or because they have to put someone behind bars who is like, I don't know, a Raj or something. Yeah. Good or uh, it, Well, yeah, like whatever, no big loss. They were a loose, they were a loose cannon anyway. <laughs> I like that setup a lot, truthfully. I think it's a really unique place to kind of start with the drama of the of the murders. Yeah. Um, not that we necessarily know that's what's going on, start of the book. I suppose the first mystery related question I have to ask you before you Uh-oh. lay out to us uh, anything you want to cover with that's- the riddles is with the death of this white woman on the train tracks, she's found with an RAF pin. Do you have any like yes. guesses as to where that might be leading and how it may coincide within the Healy case? Hold on now. It's the POW camp. Okay, so it's the RAF white and crest, but whatever the whatever the Latin phrase is on that is the same as the Greek phrase 
that Healy put in the put in the James yeah, Bible. Yeah, we did have that link. It's made. the exact same thing. Yeah, I mean, I look. I'm gonna be real with you. I think that uh, whoever that badge belonged to was probably in the same POW camp as Healy. Yeah. And there's, I think that what what probably happened uh, in the in the history of this because this is a historical novel. Yeah, is that there was like a, a couple or maybe just one, uh, you know, Ralph Whiten soldiers in this. Uh, it, Italian POW camp yeah. and Healy was there too and a bunch of people were there and they basically formed a bond and I reckon they've hidden something uh, uh, it's it's either something to do like this is, this is the part that I'm, I'm not sure like, what's being hidden here I'm gonna probably guess Italian gold mm-hmm. but I don't know I mean, I, I should say, I, I can't name the book specifically because I don't want to spoil it, but it's starting to sound a little Sherlockian, this, uh, this theory. Maybe. I, I wasn't going to say Sherlockian. I would I would have mentioned a book that cannot be named, but there, there's definitely there's definitely some, like, treasure. That's, like, my, my immediate thought is that there's some treasure that all these POW boys and uh, and such, they, they decided to, like, keep hidden. Yeah. I, I am going to guess a tontine just because that's... I've got, I've got Simpsons on the brain. Shout out to the Hellfish. Uh, but I reckon that John Healy is like running away and trying to get smart people to find him who know books because mm. whoever this person is uh, who's like rummaging through his stuff and chasing him is a part of that group, yeah, that yeah. like POW group. And they're also trying to get their hands on the treasure. And so in this, in this thought, in this theory, he stole the Dante's book so that people would be forced to come after him and hopefully either find him before this this other person did um or make sure that this other person doesn't get a hold of the the, the big the big treasure at the end the big the national treasure or whatever well yeah i mean it's interesting you say that he's trying to outrun someone because one of the last is. things we've seen is his corpse so uh, why did he stop running or was he made to stop running by whoever was after him i would assume that either i i don't think that he was caught i i th- like right now, I I subscribe to the suicide theory mm. because it, the door was bolted the inside. That said, I don't know if we looked inside the coffin. I don't know if that was a thing, which really annoys me. If that was not the case, that frustrates me. I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that yes, I as a reader also went, ah, oh, goddamn it, why didn't you open the coffin? But it's unsurprising fictionally. Yes. So in my mind, it is entirely possible because there's the bolt behind the door. So obviously, it's made to look like. Nobody went in or out. He, he died on his own, but it's very easy to hide someone in a coffin. Mm-hmm. They're, they're people size for a reason. So either there's there's someone hiding in the in the coffin, in which case they're using the police to like find this treasure, or perhaps to find the copy of of, of Dante there. Yeah, or the, the Divine Comedy, I think, is probably the best shorthand. Or he did or... he did murder himself. Uh, in which case, it's probably more to do with the fact that he's been sitting there for four days and he's like given up hope of being found or or such and so forth. Oh, you reckon he was like taking sleeping pills just to bide the time and was hoping he would actually be met by someone. I mean, maybe he was like, I'll camp out for a couple of days, see if someone shows up. Oh no, it's been three days and I've got no food or water. I'm just going to, you know, off myself. It seems a little extreme. He wasn't that far outside the city. He wasn't. He wasn't. But yeah, that 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 part I'm I'm less sure of. But clearly he's either... Killed himself, or someone has killed him. Mm. Um, I I would not be surprised by they were hiding in the coffin situation. Yep, yep. But if if he's killed himself with sleeping pills, I think it was more of a uh, I you know I don't I don't know how long I'm gonna have to wait. I'd rather this secret like go with me to my grave than yeah I'd be caught and have it beaten out of me by whoever's on my tail. This you know. <laughs> presumably ripped uh, POW individual who's chasing me. That. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be my guess. Yeah, you seem you you seem pretty locked in on the link between these two cases, so I won't I won't really press you there. That's that's the strongest part of my theory. It's it just figure out why the Divine Comedy is in the book. I yeah, guess yeah. is the part that I'm like stuck on because I want it. Like obviously, that's the prize of the book that we're chasing after. Mm. But also, why did he take the book if that was the prize? Like, why not just leave it with the society? Yeah, I do. I do have theories relating to that that we might discuss in the future. But I hope so. That's that's what we have to do. It's true. We do. But um, th- you know, there might be reasons why you want to get away from, from the society itself and away from from certain people. Alrighty, now herds. Last year, we for our third year of Uh-oh. the show, we did a triple or nothing game. Uh, there was there was suggestions that we were going to do a quadruple or nothing game. 
uh, this year. You're down. Quadruple or nothing. Those are the biggest stakes yeah. that we've ever had. Mm-hmm. Quadruple or nothing. It almost makes the, the past three years mean nothing. Well, I mean, when, when the stipulation is that someone goes to zero, we have to give them a means to catch up. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Fair enough. You know what? I'm with you. The game wouldn't work right. if we didn't keep raising the stakes. <laughs> the, game would, the game wouldn't work if we didn't keep raising the stakes to make the previous year not matter at all. Anyway, you're absolutely with you correct. at zero, yep. mm-hmm. with you at zero now, herds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I sure. will. I will award you a point for for posing a theory this week, as as we continued okay. with last year. Oh, is that enough for a theory? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, cool. I reckon. I okay. reckon I'm happy with that link. If you want to make some more firm predictions, I can. Uh, I can perhaps toss a second point your way. Okay. Well, if that's enough for a point, then I wanna. I would have put it on the table that Forrester is suspicious as heck. She's got big Amogus energy, and I don't like her very You're much. You're telling me that the ruthless single lady who runs the society is is, is suspicious in some way? A little bit. Can I tell you that I, I'm surprised? Why were you never remarried? It's yeah, because well. I'm so normal and <laughs> I'm not going to yeah, I be mean, a cold emotions killer at the end of this tale. I definitely need to go back through uh, all the times that we've like spoken with her and people have spoken about her. But yeah, people have been like, I made advances on her and she was really cold and da 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 da. I mean, to be fair, yeah, you know, Persis is a is a single lady yeah, yeah, who yeah, seems yeah. to brush off advances. So are you are you saying that Which Persis makes her a great is a cold, foil. ruthless killer? No, makes her a great foil for our main okay, character. Okay. Anyway. But uh, I, the thing that I'm, I'm surprised you, you haven't put forward immediately is that, well, if John Healy is trying to keep the clues away from, you know, he wants smart people to figure it out, mm-hmm. then, then why would he leave the King James Bible somewhere where Forrester could get access to it? But as we all know, she, she literally fumbled the first clue. Yes. <laughs> she fumbled the ball immediately. So... Uh, I would wager that that he left the clue, the the Greek phrase of of follow the truth or follow Alice. Yes. Um, knowing that a she would be too hung up on her own public image to seek help in that regard, uh, and also that she is not an expert in in Greek uh, nuance. She's she's a very like brass tacks history kind of lady i did i mean you kind of did already but yeah before we wrap up i did love the scene where she goes to get the greek retranslated and the guy's like do you see what i'm reading here yeah (laughs) do i look like an expert to you (laughs) (laughs) it's pretty it's a pretty great scene well he literally retranslates it in front of her he's like it's a very easy mistake to make you can just you can smell her fuming it's so anyway Anyway, yep. the reason I raised the quadruple or nothing game, Herds, both because it's the first episode of the year, Oh, but also because I have a challenge for you. Oh, no. In chapter 19, we are presented our next riddle. Oh, good. I want you to stop at that point, solve the riddle, and then alert me when you think you're ready. We can record a short coverage of your interpretation and then press on uh, with the following chapters so that uh, you get the chance to actually solve a riddle uh, on the show rather than being subverted. I was so disappointed. I was like, yo, can I actually, you know what I need to tell you about? Rather than talking about the riddle that actually matters, I spent far too long trying to figure out what the second, uh, Dante's, I guess, the, the opening lines of was. the Divine Comedy. Yes, the opening lines of the Divine Comedy. I read them and was like, halfway through life, Came to myself a dark wood. Is this like a river? I spent like 20 minutes maybe looking up rivers and trying to figure out if there was like a mirrored lake or something or a specific wood. It was it was insane. I found there's a lot of temples on the banks of rivers, yeah. uh, by the way, just so you yeah, know that. Yeah. Anyway, in Bombay. Let's anyway. Uh, let's <laughs> let's get to it. So you're gonna solve that riddle in chapter 19, alert sure. me to it, and then our next episode proper will be up at to and including chapter 31. So 16 to 31 mm. for next week, but we'll take a pause at 19 for you in the middle of the week, Herds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can slot that and in I, I hope you enjoy that one. I think you'll I think you'll have fun with it. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm going to put two points up for grabs on that riddle in particular. Ooh. But I should be oh, clear God. that the, the second point will be for extrapolating on uh, the riddle itself. So be ready to- th- So it's not enough to say, it's in the Surrey Cemetery. I have to say, like, it's under the lion statue in the corner underneath. Is that what you mean? Pretty much. I think I think you'll be able to get this one. I was able to figure it out narrowly. Uh, I had a bit of help from Dr. Google. Of course. I mean, how else am I supposed to not learn about Indian history, if not through Google? But I, I, I believe in your ability. So that'll be, that'll be our stretch for next week. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the return 
of Death of the Reader for 2022. I'm very excited to press on with this book. It's been a great way to start the year. Look, I've really enjoyed hanging out with Vasim Khan, getting a look inside his brain. It's been great. <laughs> I just don't tell anyone how much Wikipedia I've been using in my research because it would make my English teacher cry. <laughs> um, yeah. She, they would not be happy. I'm, uh, I'm excited to get to it. 16 to 31 next week on the show. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. And we'll see you next week.